everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to review the open source game engine Godot. Now I've heard some people call it Godot because of the robot logo, but I'm going to call it Godot as in waiting for Godot and I think that's what a lot of other people are going with. But this is a fairly new engine. Its first stable release was only a few months ago in August and it's definitely gotten more popular in the past year, though it's really young software. But I've also been seeing a lot of you guys request that I talk about it, so let's just get right into it. So first and foremost, Godot is open source, which is already a huge plus in my books. And for those of you who don't really know what that means, open source projects are freely available for both personal and and commercial use. So you have a lot of engines out there where they're free for personal use, but once you make a certain amount of money, you have to either, in Unity's case, upgrade to a pro subscription, or you might have to pay royalties, like a 5-10% cut, to the makers of the engine. But open source projects like Godot, Godot is truly open source, meaning you can do whatever you want with it, you can fork it, modify it, you can hopefully uh, give back to the community. You can see I fixed a trivial bug so I can guilt you all into also trying to help out and fix things as well. Um, but there are a lot of open source engines out there, or there's quite a few, but this is one of the few 2D, 3D hybrids that is actually very powerful and effective and that I really enjoyed. So I'll start by talking about the scripting, since that's kind of how I learn a new engine, is the scripting, how it interfaces with the editor. Uh, it looks like they're going to support more popular languages like C Sharp, which is nice, but they currently have an integrated scripting language called, I think, just Godot language. And it's pretty similar to Python, you can see, like it's abandoned uh, brackets, you have these kind of space tab issues. I don't know, I'm sorry, I use spaces and tabs. So this will drive everyone absolutely crazy for the whole video, I apologize. I found that if the documentation for the Godot language is lacking, you could often make your best Pythonic guess and that might be, that might compile in Godot. Um, so I'll show you guys a quick little example of my game. So this is a little 2D game. Uh, it has a branching narrative and characters that respond to your actions. So it's kind of a story-based game. And the art is brought to you by the default robot logo that comes with every new project and the first Creative Commons licensed search result for Pixel Grass and this Microsoft Paint uh, rectangle. So really state-of-the-art, high-quality work coming to you guys just for this tutorial. This is what you've all been waiting for. Anyway, so let's play this. So you can also see it loads really quickly. That's one thing that I like. We don't need this breakpoint here. Uh, the projects load really quickly. Godot is the engine lo Oh God. Um, anyway, we have our little player character. And then this guy, let's pretend he's like Robot Professor Oak. Cause he's like, hello young child. And then we're like, we're not a child. And then he's a grown up. And then are we a boy or a girl? We're a girl. And then he says, okay, I took um, like sensitivity training, so I need to let you answer neither. So we say neither, but the form only has two check boxes that he's filling out. So, you know, and then he wants to know our name. Okay, so um, sensitivity trained Professor Oak asked us a bunch of questions. And then you see when we talk to him again, he just says, excuse me, I said, what is your name? So we didn't go through that whole dialogue tree again. He responds to the fact that we've already talked to him. Okay, now let's go over here and we'll see this brick. So we see it's a brick. Yep, definitely a brick. And we go away. And for some reason, because he is wildly jealous of our newfound brick relationship, he's like, ah, okay. That's just to show that he's reacting to the event of us checking the brick. So let's check the brick one more time and nothing's changed here. It's still a brick. I have better things to do. So that's just a little demo that uh, we have branching dialogue. We have characters responding to different events. All right, I'll post a tutorial later showing exactly how I got that working. But for now, that's what I made and that's where I'm getting 
most of these impressions. All right, so my impressions of the scripting. This is the script that I have attached to my player node, and I'll talk about nodes in a minute. But these, like, what, 40 lines of pretty readable, simple code handle the player's movement, the collision detections, uh, triggering dialogue events, and that's like 80 to 90% of what we need the player to handle throughout most of, like, a story-based kind of game. And even for more complicated stuff, like arguably making the dialogue and event parsing system is probably the most complicated part of this little project, but it was still really easy and really manageable. Uh, you can see I just have all of my assets, I guess, my narrative assets, like our choices, the potential events, and then the actual dialogue and branching logic. Uh, these are just all stored in JSON files, and I can just load them up and then basically right in Python. So it's really nice. And I also found their event handling system, the events and signals were really easy to figure out. For example, if we want something to happen when we press this button, so we want to get the next piece of dialogue when we click the dialogue button, uh, we just say when it's pressed, connect it to a function called on button pressed, which is just right up here. So if this event happens, run this function. I don't know, it's very simple. It's one line of code. I like it. Uh, we can also group things together. So you see this kind of rectangle VHS looking thing by item and professor. That's because they're both of the interactable group. That's just a group I made up. And they have these area 2D boxes. It's this, um, this collider right here the area 2D. And that means that we won't run into it. We won't um, like get stuck like a static collider. That's what this one in the middle is. Here, I'll show you guys really fast. Um, see, we can run into him, but the area, we can still talk to him from like here, right? And so we've grouped these as interactables and we say for each interactable, let's see over here, for each interactable, we get all of them, we say if they have an area 2D node attached to them, then we're going to connect this to the player's kind of interaction handler. So that was also really, really simple to initialize that for a bunch of objects on the screen. As I could keep making objects and just add them to the group and make sure they have, um, you know, a collider, and that's it. And so here I'll also take a moment to mention the code editor and debugger that's integrated with Godot's engine. Uh, many people, like myself, who use Unity or UE4 will use something like Visual Studio or, I don't know, maybe use Mono Develop or something. And I do miss the comforts of Visual Studio. I do enjoy it. Uh, but most of what you functionally need is here. You have auto-completing, like if I say uh, interactables, that's like a variable I have. You have autocomplete, um, but I would say my one complaint is that it can be difficult to get useful information from this debugger. Uh, let's get rid of this. Uh, you can see, for example, under cur node, that's this, it should just be one of these uh, nodes, like the professor or the item but we get this like zero right here. Now what you can do is go through, let's see, let's play the game. What we can do is go to the debugger and we can go, go to this remote inspector and we can take a look at the entire scene tree like as things are currently in the game. So we can see like the player's position and just to prove it, we're gonna move the player so we can see everything change uh, in real time, but let's say I want to know exactly what is cur node at this moment. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to maybe print out its ID and then go look in the scene tree. Uh, it would be a lot easier if when we break, we could just take a look um, and open up these different objects. And so I've mentioned nodes a lot, but let's talk about what those are. I think they really make this engine unique, and I think it also can seem a little bit confusing at first, but it makes everything really fast and organized. So a blank node like this is pretty similar to an empty object in Unity. And a node can have all these different children representing, uh, you know, for example, the professor, he has his interactable collider, he has a static collider, and then, you know, the sprite and so on. These are all child nodes. 
Uh, and they're all also relative to the parent's coordinate. So for example, we have this canvas layer. The panel is relative to this kind of camera view box. And then the button's position is relative to the panel. So for example, once again, just to prove it to you, we go here. I know this is probably very small, but if we say zero, zero, it'll move to the panel zero, zero, not global zero, zero. I don't know. That's just also useful. But you can also have any branch of this scene be its own scene. Now that's what might be confusing at first. So for example, we can take the professor, because let's say we want the professor to appear again with the same general properties and sprite. We can save this branch of the game tree as its own scene. So we're going to call it, yeah, professor.t scene. And what we can do is then instance, see this chain right here, we can load and instance another professor node. So let's say we open up a new scene, we click this instancing button, and we click on our player scene. So this gives us everything that was in our player, the kinematic body, the camera, the sprite, uh, the scripts attached. It's the exact same branch that we had over here. And so now we can reuse it really easily, no copy paste, you don't have to rebuild it. Uh, it's a really easy and intuitive way to work, I think, once you get into that flow. Uh, I really like this idea that the whole game is just like a hierarchical tree. Now let's briefly touch on the 3D editor. So I tend not to make 3D games in my own personal projects, so I'm not going to pretend I have knowledge that I do not. But from what I've tested out and from what I've heard from 3D developers, Godot has pretty much everything you'd need to make any 3D game that you would on Unity, for the most part. I think the biggest core difference between Unity and Godot in general is just that it's Unity is more popular. Uh, and that means you're going to have free and cheap assets and plugins and tutorials and documentation and forum posts. Uh, like if you look up how to do thing in C Sharp, you can find a Stack Overflow post probably telling you everything you need. And if you look up how to do thing in Unity, there's probably a forum post that tells you exactly what you need. But I found this personally with Godot, it's just very new, and so there's less volume of community content, which is definitely something to consider. Uh, the documentation and tutorials on the website are great, they're actually really clear, and you can look at the source code to see how things work for yourself, but you know, sometimes it's really nice to just type in a search engine and get the answer. Lastly, I think one of the key deciding factors of whether you want to use Godot or a more popular proprietary engine is what it exports to and what platforms you can make games for. So it does export to Windows and App. So it does export to Windows and OS X. And once again, this is all for free. You don't need to like buy export build licenses and also Android, iOS, and HTML5. So those are kind of the main heavy hitters, but it is true that Unity does have pretty much every platform, every main platform that people are using from VR, PlayStation, Xbox, everything. But in conclusion, really genuinely, I enjoyed working in this engine a lot. I learned the flow a lot more quickly than I thought. At first when I opened it up, I was like, I have no idea what's going on, but then it made a lot of sense. It made a lot more sense than some conventions in other tools I've used. So I'm actually probably going to continue with this project, hopefully under this framework, not necessarily a uh, professor being jealous of Brick, the game, uh, <laughs> but I will give a tutorial on how to do branching dialogue and the event system that I made here. So look out for that. If if you're interested in actually how to just get things started in Godot if you want to learn more details. If you like this, then definitely subscribe for more game dev and programming videos. But most importantly, have a happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!